Now this building, the Washington Meeting House or Town Hall, is unique in the sense that it is one of perhaps 50 or so of these large two-story meeting houses that were built in New Hampshire during the 1700s. But it's one of only about 10 that survive more or less in intact condition and portray their full evolution in a very interesting and coherent way. The interior finish is unusual in this building, perhaps unique. The uh, joiner or finished carpenter who was responsible for that was a man named Church Tabor, who interestingly enough did not come from this area initially. He was born and probably trained in the area of Tiverton, Rhode Island, which is not far from Newport, Rhode Island. Um, <clears throat> and he probably came out of his apprenticeship about 1774, 1775, and undoubtedly was trained in the very high level of skill that was obvious down in the Newport, Rhode Island area. So we really are seeing in the small frontier town of Washington, New Hampshire, a um, immediate reflection of some of the most sophisticated joinery and architectural design that would have prevailed in New England at that time. The detailing of this work, uh, which you can see with the raking light running across the moldings and across the triglyphs and so forth, is beautifully executed. This is very characteristic 18th century paneling, what we call today raised paneling. It has a little quarter round molding around it. All done by hand tools, all done uh, in a way that almost looks uh, machine made in, in its perfection, but actually executed with the very simplest of tools. This glass was hand blown. It's what's called crown glass, and the way in which a glass blower made this glass was to blow a large bubble of glass at the end of a blowing tube, and then to open up that bubble <clears throat> while the glass was still in a plastic hot form, and to spin it to the point that that bubble suddenly flew open almost like an umbrella and became a large disc. And then that disc would have been cut with a diamond into the panes of glass that you see here. So what you have is a remnant of that fact that this was spun open into a large disc. The paint that we are seeing right in this location is a handmade paint made with a red ochre, which is an iron oxide paint, basically um, a rust, a naturally occurring rust that occurs as a pigment in the soil mixed with presumably linseed oil, which would have been the oil that would have been pressed from the seeds of the flax plant, which was grown widely in New Hampshire, uh, mostly for making textiles, uh, for making um, uh, linen. But um, that oil that was made from the seeds was a perfect vehicle or liquid portion of the paint. So when this building was painted, it would have been red. Meeting houses were painted in a variety of other colors. We have record of meeting houses being painted red, yellow, brown, occasionally even blue, and the variations that occurred um, denote the types of pigments that would have been readily available in the 18th century. And the buildings were very uh, similar to one another uh, because there was simply an accepted norm in New England in the 18th century for meeting house, and people did not see fit to vary from that except in level of craftsmanship, where in this building, for example, we have a higher level of craftsmanship than would have been common in the 1780s. We transmit culture from generation to generation. And one way in which we can transmit culture is through the object as well as through the spoken and written word. So when we indulge in the act of preserving a building or a group of buildings like the Washington Common Area, we're actually transmitting what has been given to us from past generations through the current generation and offering that as a legacy to the future generations.